You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne. Recorded 10 a.m. on May 12, 2024. Presented by Rev. Chris Duke. So our reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we're going to read verses 1 to 9. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labour. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his holy word. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider these words this morning, we pray that your spirit will speak to us and teach us more from it, and help us to apply it to our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. From 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul was dealing with divisions in the church, which revealed that there were factions and schisms that appeared in this Corinthian church, and each faction claimed its superiority when they big noted their favourite leader. I followed Paul, some were saying, well, others stated, I follow Cephas, or I follow Apollos, and even the more pious said, I follow Christ. So Paul, as the good pastor, he's working to eliminate the reasons for division. Therefore, Paul, for the remainder of chapter 1 and some of chapter 2, aims to explode the pride that permeates each faction by discussing the message that believers were entrusted to share. You see, the message appears in the eyes of the world to be weak and foolish. And by inference, the members therefore also appear to be weak and foolish in the world's eyes. And due to this assessment, there's the temptation to reject this message and to fall on boasting on about oneself and about one's own ability, trusting in your own wisdom and your own strength. Yet Paul shows that it's precisely the weak and the foolish things by which God works mightily so that indeed our pride will be shattered and his wisdom alone exalted. And so last week we looked at how this foolish gospel message works that through the work of the Holy Spirit, this foolish message that's shared with the unbeliever is the power of God unto salvation. How does that work? It works because the weak, foolish message is in fact the revelation of God himself recorded in the scriptures by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and received to us, by us, through illumination of the Holy Spirit. And so we dealt with this in chapter 2. But now in chapter 3, Paul brings us directly back to the problem of division. Today we're going to look at two comparisons that Paul uses to structure his argument concerning factions. And Paul in verses 1 to 4 uses a comparison derived from feeding babies, babes who need milk because they're not yet ready for the solid food. And then in the second comparison from verses 5 to 9, it describes the church as God's field, 
where God sends out his servants, that is, people to minister the gospel, sowing the seed of the word, then to water, where God himself gives the growth in a believer's relationship in Christ and also growth in the church. It's God who gives the increase. Next week we'll look at a third comparison, discussing the church as God's building, actually God's temple where he dwells by his spirit. Now we're all familiar with the, we're all familiar with the idea of food that a baby at first needs. And we're all familiar with agriculture in this comparison, in this paddock, God's paddock. He sends his servants to sow and water the seed. Now for some of you mothers here, I'm sure you can remember the event of your firstborn baby. I'm sure you can remember the birth of all your children, all of your babies. At the time our firstborn, my firstborn was due, it had become fashionable for fathers to be present at the birth. It turned out to be a memorable experience. <laughs> I can say that easily. All I had to do was hold the hand at the, at the front of the, uh, at the top of the bed when our Matthew James was born. He seemed to want to take his time. But then he came and he was born. It was a happy time with a very relieved mother and father. Now back then new mothers were treated very well in maternity wards, in hospitals. Uh, the nurses looked after the mothers and newborn babies very well. They, uh, in our case, we had private health insurance and hospital insurance and it was the usual thing for the mother to recover from the birthing experience, spending up to a week, if not a few more days after that, in hospital to be treated well. It gave time for the nurses to ensure that each baby was feeding properly, that is, from the mother in the natural way. Matthew seemed to be going okay. Then when mother and child came home, we had a call from the local district nurse who made an appointment to visit us. We knew her. I taught her kids at school. And she was also a family, her and her family, they came to the church we attended. It was a pleasant surprise. Once again, this professional person, Diane was her name, a fellow believer in Christ, made sure that our newborn infant was feeding properly and growing. So from then on, Jude would take our son to the clinic for regular weigh-ins. And then we would map the weight and the body length to the expectant growth charts and we'd map that out and check how things were going. In our children's case, they grew normally and as expected. But what happens when a child isn't growing as expected? Well, then you need to find out and then you need to address the reasons why the child isn't growing and isn't flourishing. There could be a health issue. There could be a malnutrition issue. Now, Paul is our skilled dietitian today. And he examines the spiritual condition of the Corinthian believers. And like unwell babies, the Corinthian believers were failing to thrive. They suffered from spiritual immaturity. And then in verses 3 to 4, Paul identifies the underlying causes of these believers of their failure to spiritually thrive. And then from verses 5 to 9, Paul begins his treatment plan, his remedy. So today we're going to look at Paul's diagnosis, we're going to look at the underlying causes, and we're going to look at Paul's remedy. Now, Paul's diagnosis is extremely swift. Look what he says in verses 1 to 2. At the end of verse 1, he says, As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are not ready. Like all babies, they started on the milk, but as yet are not ready for the solid food. At first they needed simple teaching. 
And Paul wasn't able to go on into the more detailed teaching because these believers were stuck in a loop of repeating the basics over and over again. You could say that their growth was stunted as they failed to thrive. They were not developing, they were not maturing as they ought and this is a serious problem. However, the Corinthians prided themselves for being spiritual people. Now Paul tries to break down their defences. He wants them to wake up. Look at Paul's language in verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. And then in verse 3, for you are still of the flesh. What Paul is saying is that after Paul came to them, since there was no evidence that they were making any progress, as he began to teach them, he could only speak to them in baby language. Now all the mothers know here that it's all right, all right, always okay at first to say goo ga goo ga but then you start to say real words and you want to plant those real words in the minds of your children. You could only speak to them in baby language. They were not maturing as disciples. And their ongoing problem is that they are still of the flesh and still immature. Yes, they've been converted for sure, but they're still only infants in Christ. Yes, God in the person of the Holy Spirit has enabled them to believe and has come and has enabled them to come to faith in Christ Jesus and has made them new creatures in union with Christ. But their behaviour is still worldly, it's still fleshly, and as such you couldn't see them as spiritual and as maturing disciples. You see, there are still patterns of the old lifestyle. Now this is a dreadful diagnosis. When you see a child that behaves maturely beyond their years, you're generally impressed by that, aren't you? It's nice to see. And often you'll praise or make some sort of comment about that, either to them or to their parents. But it's the opposite when you come across an adult who behaves and acts like a baby. The Corinthian believers should have made more significant progress in their spiritual walk with Christ. They're still babies in Christ. Now, years ago on TV, there used to be, I'm not sure if it's still going, a TV show called Dr Phil. But here we have our own Dr Paul is working out the Corinthian diagnosis. And Paul makes his diagnosis on examination of their spiritual condition. You see, they're immature and not progressing in godliness. Rather, they're fleshly, worldly, infant, that rather, that this is what they are, they're worldly and fleshly and they're immature. I wonder what the diagnosis what Dr. Paul's diagnosis would be for each one of us individually. If Paul were to look at your case notes, would he write failure to thrive or would he write progressing nicely or something like that? A Christian failing to grow in Christ is pitiful. Now Paul in verses 3 to 4 quickly gives us the causes. He identifies the underlying causes for their failure to thrive. Here is the reason for their lack of growth. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being mere, merely human? The issues that hindering growth is jealousy and strife. And pride has caused them to fight over which faction was the best one to belong to. It was either the Paul party or it was the Peter party or it was the Apollos party who looked down on each other and they're squabbling over which faction is the best. 
and they're taking offence, holding grudges and muttering as they meet together with one another even. Just imagine some of the stares they gave each other. So Paul says that your behaviour is to behave in only a human way. And this literally means to act according to man. To behave and act if Christ were not your Lord and as if the Holy Spirit had made you a, a new creature in Christ. Their behaviour was not befitting a believer and follower of Christ. Now I guess there are implications for what Paul is saying here. As new believers in Christ, Paul is getting to the central theme for spiritual growth. Christians must learn to live under a new management. A new management. To live under new management, we're no longer our own. We've been bought at a price and we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means we no longer have any right to live under pride or jealousy. We have no right to self-righteous anger. When was the last time you lost your temper? Maybe with uh, your children or maybe with your husband or husbands with your wives. Now, of course, I never do that. Just as well my children aren't here. Julie's here, she might tell you that differently. Now you lose your temper and your wife says, you need to calm down, dear. You don't need to be so angry. But often we think that we have every right to be angry and to lose our tempers. And we so often become self-righteous and we justify our behaviour in everything we think and in everything that we do. And we cast the blame onto someone else without ever looking at ourselves. And so Paul comes along here and he says directly, you're behaving only in a human way. You're acting according to man. You're acting as if you're in charge, as if you have the right to set the terms by which everyone else around you should behave towards you and respond towards you and relate to you and deal with you. Friends, this is a false premise because you now belong to Christ and you're in Christ now. You're under new management. You're his. You're not your own. You see, friends, Jesus loves you, loves you so much that he bled and he died and he bore your sin and he bore your guilt and he reconciled to you to God by his cross that when you believed upon him, you were adopted into God's family and the household of faith. As such, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are his and you live for him. And as you continue to rule the throne of your own heart, it's little wonder you make little progress. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, no wonder your Christian life is so stunted and it's immature. No wonder you fail to thrive. You're divisive, you have a schismatic spirit driven by jealousy and pride, played out in strife and fr friction and fighting and it only, pr only proves that you're behaving like babies. It's time that you grew up. The diagnosis was a failure to thrive spiritually and behave spiritually mature. And the underlying causes are divisions and jealousy and pride acting according to man. But you're still living under the old management of sin and self when in fact we've become to live under the new management, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul finally gets to the solution. Paul's treatment plan for the problem now comes in, in verses 1 to 4. We had this metaphor that babes need milk, not solid food. Now we come to the agricultural uh, comparison. And there are servants working in the field. 
and they're sowing seed and they're watering the seed. Now the field here is the church. That is the people of God. Verses 5 to 6, Paul says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? And then he answers, Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And Paul wants us to know how true Christian growth takes place. So he begins by discrediting their false premise concerning their favourite teachers, concerning their favourite preachers. Paul actually here deliberately removes himself from off the pedestal that Corinthian believers had placed him on. So he asks, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? What are they? And Paul topples them, topples himself from the pedestal which the Corinthians had begun to place he and Apollos and others on. You see, they're only servants, Paul says. They're agricultural workers. They're farm hands. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. They're only servants. These servants are not the ones to whom you owe your salvation. I, Paul, I, Apollos, didn't convert you. I didn't change you. We didn't change you or bring you to faith in Jesus. You see, they're only servants. They're only the instruments used to lead you to Christ. Therefore, your attention shouldn't rest upon a man or upon a person or on a preacher, but solely on the Lord whose servants these preachers and teachers are. So Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. It's not I, Paul or Apollos that you should focus your attention on. They didn't cause your Christian life to begin nor can they make it grow. Yes, they did plant the seed and yes, they did water the seed and they preached and they taught and they shepherded and they corrected you. But where does growth come from? Where does life come from? Where should you look for grace when you fail to thrive? When by God's grace did we come to see that our Christian lives have been stunted and we've failed to mature as believers? Where then should we look for new life? For a growth spurt, as it were. Paul says in, in verse 6, God gave the growth. And then in verse 7, God still gives the growth in the present time. Don't look to man for the grace that only God can give you. Don't look to pastors for life. It's only faith in Christ that can give you life. And while you boast in Paul and while you boast in Apollos, what would be the equivalent today? Maybe we could boast in Calvin or we would boast in Wesley or Whitfield or, or um, maybe a contemporary preacher today. The truth is we are all one, Paul says. And verse 8 says, He who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his wages according to his labour. For we are God's fellow workers. As such, then, you are God's field. We're all in the same team, working together in God's field as his fellow labourers, but only God gives the growth. Please note this, church. God gives the growth numerically, spiritually, corporately, in our life together, individually also, in our Christian walk, one by one. Not a pastor or a plan, or events, or programs, as important as they could be. Growth is God's business, and it comes from him alone. When we take our focus off God, and we take our focus off his work, we then tend to look to leaders instead of Christ for our growth. And we either do one of two things. We either lionise them because we believe they have all the answers, or we demonise them 
because we believe they're the problem. And then the church begins to fracture and divisions begin to rise. Strife and jealousy show their ugly heads and acting in a merely human way, acting according to man, our growth is stunted and we fail to thrive. So I wonder if that's a pattern that you recognise in your heart. What's your diagnosis after hearing Dr Paul? Are you failing to thrive? Are you a baby Christian who ought to have grown, grown up a long time ago? Perhaps you're looking to men instead of looking to Christ. Perhaps there's strife and jealousy causing divisions bubbling up in your heart. Now the essence of what Paul is saying here, really the essence is a call to repentance by us. A call by all means to use the means God has given people and plans and programs sometimes, but as you call, as a call no longer to place our trust and hope and confidence for vitality and growth in them, but to come back to the Lord who alone gives the increase. We need to come back to Jesus who gives the growth that we need. We can give a new growth spurt. For far too long we've been stuck in spiritual immaturity. If you're a Christian, you've come to live under new management. Is Jesus on the throne of your heart? Is he Lord? Perhaps you've been trying to live as if Jesus isn't Lord. Paul says it's time to repent. Your spiritual immaturity is the symptom of which your refusal to bend the knee to King Jesus is the cause. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. Is he Lord of your heart? Friends, bend the knee to him today. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, indeed we pray that you would help us to grow up in our spiritual lives to maturity, no longer depending on the milk but on the solid food of your word and also, Lord, in the way we live. And, and Lord, we just pray that each one of us might have a deeper experience of the Lord Jesus Christ in our daily walk with you. Help us indeed to, to enable you to be Lord of our lives, Lord of our hearts, and Lord of all of our thoughts and our actions. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church.org.au or wherever you get your podcasts from.